Anybody get any rest this week? Anybody take me up on the offer and God's offer really on the Sabbath? How many of y'all did that? Yeah, who you did that? It was good, brilliant. Glad you guys are here. We're in a message series that I've entitled Warring with the Gods. And we've been looking at um, three gods that derail us. Uh, we first covered the God of power. Today we're gonna cover the God of possessions. And then after this, we're gonna cover the God of, of pleasure. And so um, thank you guys for being here. Do me a favor before we get into the message. Would you uh, uh, put your hands together and welcome your church family watching online. Glad you all are watching. Glad you all are here. Um, Thank you for being here. I know there could be lots of reasons why you aren't today, especially the storm and power outages maybe could have made uh, getting here uh, tricky, so I'm glad you're here. Oftentimes in the beginning of our worship service, we'll give you some time with your family to go over some points of gratitude. Um, and this week, I just wanted to kind of just do that on my own, some things that I became aware of yesterday and, and this morning that I was grateful for. Um, I'm grateful for all of the folks who are working um, to restore power and keep us powered with heating and cooling in our homes. I'm really thankful for all the utility workers. I mean, I'm just thankful that they're doing their jobs. And I know many of them in, in, are in dangerous situations at times too. It's, a, it's an intense thing. So I'm really thankful for that. Um, the other thing I was thankful for as um, the hours went on with no power, as we hit about the eight or 10 hour mark with no power, I started getting concerned about uh, freezer, freezers full of meat and uh, that made me a little anxious, but it also reminded me of how thankful I am for our farmers. Uh, we have many uh, utility workers and farmers in our church family and how thankful I am for their tireless work. My wife sent me a, um, an article that um, many farmers in some situations are being offered money um, at a pretty decent clip of money to stop farming. And um, I think that's a bad idea. Um, I think it's a bad idea to pay people to stop making food. It's just, my, it's just me, I don't know, I could be overthinking it, but I think that's kind of a bad idea. Thank God for the integrity and hard work of farmers to say, no, I'm not gonna take the money and run, I'm gonna keep on uh, doing the work. Them, thankful for the, the farmers and the truck drivers. Man, if the truck drivers and the farmers ever like band together, I think they could run the whole world. I mean, imagine if farmers and truck drivers stopped doing their job today. We're, we're in a bad spot, right? So I'm thankful for all of those um, folks and just thought it would be good to honor um, them today before we get into today's message, all right? Um, one other thing, I leave right after the service. My daughter and I leave um, for Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, it's a camp meeting um, at our alma mater. Um, and actually, my wife and son... They're probably past St. Louis by now. They left last night around um, midnight and um, Angie and uh, Alex are on a road trip going to take him to Bible school. So we'll meet them there tonight and be at, all, at camp meeting all next week and, and Audrey and I will come home on Friday. And I really wish I could be a, a mouse or fly in the car during Angie and Alex's road trip. I think that would be very fascinating. Um, I just think it would be incredible to be in that room or in that car space, whatever it is. Um, they need lots of room probably to control their egos. <laughs> Hopefully they're not watching. If they are, I love you. I'm just, just teasing. You can, we can have a conversation when I arrive. <laughs> I arrive. <laughs> um, so today, um, part four, I believe it is, of warring with the gods. I'm going to talk to you about a mammon, the god of possessions, and this series was born out of some observations that I had made and also out of the response that you gave about what you need to hear from God's word in order to grow when we did that survey at Easter time as we do almost every year at Easter. You said things like time, uh, things like culture, things like um, cultural pressure. Um, and I, I read a quote to you, I wanna read it again this week and, and here's what it says. Um, Unchurched and unbelievers are asking spiritual questions. I believe that to be true. And the part of that quote that grabbed me was the second part, and it says this. Un unbelievers and unchurched people are asking spiritual questions. They just don't think the church can help them. And I took that kind of personally and said, okay, wait a minute. Maybe, maybe there's a, an area that we're avoiding for lack of understanding, a lack of perspective, lack of remembering, lack of... Um, being 
um, around individuals who are really maybe wrestling with spiritual questions in a way that uh, we can get disconnected from if we become insulated and get in a church bubble. And so we started this series and we've talked a lot about the introduction about what these gods look like a little bit. And then the last two weeks I talked about the God of power and the resolution for that is, is the Sabbath. Not a ritualistic religious approach, but a spiritual attitude that wants God at the center of our lives. And last week we did practical things on how we could incorporate the Sabbath. And I know many, many of you are doing that and are gonna to continue to do that. Um, I wanna remind you of the text that we've started with. Deuteronomy chapter six, verse 14 says this, do not follow other gods, the gods of the people around you. Deuteronomy eleven sixteen 16 says this, be careful or you'll be enticed to turn away and worship other gods and bow down to them. I, this is worth repeating, that we are not exempt from that in a modern culture. There are still gods that seek our attention and we're giving it to them. But we can avoid them and win over this spiritually if we'll take 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11 to heart. And here's what Paul says. So that, or in order that, Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. So Paul says basically this. Um, you do not have to be outwitted by the devil you can be aware of his schemes. And so today, we're gonna unmask this God of possession. See exactly um, how it works, but I want you to know that we're coming at it from a position of victory. And, and the man that I look to right now in this season of my life to pastor me uh, was here in May, Pastor and Mrs. Hagen. He sends me a text every Sunday before uh, service, sometimes on Saturday, but usually on Sunday. And I asked him if I could just share it with you guys, because it was for me. But I felt like it was for all of us in a, in a way. And so he said you could, I could share it. This is what his text said this morning. I believe your Sunday will be a great one. I'm gonna receive that. Gonna be a great one. And he goes on and he says this. God has destined you to win. Jesus has gone before you and secured your victory. So you've won before you ever even get to the battlefield. Whatever you're facing, I want you to understand that you've already been made more than a conqueror. Spiritually speaking, Jesus always causes you to triumph. That's a, that's a Bible promise. Now, it may not look the way you want it to look. It may not feel the way you think it should feel, but that's his promise to us. And so the God of possession is revert, referred to in Scripture as mammon. The God of pleasure we see in different cultures Asherah is the, is the Hebrew name, and then the God of power, which is Baal, we've already looked at, and we'll look at the God of pleasure next. So, um, before we do this, I want you to understand something. Nothing is meaningful without a context. A context matters. Um, let me tell a little example about my, my wife. Um, so, I, I remind her of this, that context matters. Because my wife, and I probably do it too, but I, um, she's on a road trip so I can pick on her, right? Uh, I, I will be in a conversation with my wife, and you've probably been this with a, a, a relative, a spouse, whatever. I've done this too, but, but for the sake of it, she does it more often than I do. I'll be in a con, she'll have, this is how it goes. She starts talking to me after she's been talking to herself for an extended period of time and expects me to know what that previous conversation was in her head. And it'll go something like this. I really can't believe they said or did that. Can you believe they did that? What are we talking about? Have you seen the price of that? Context, baby. Like, what do you mean? What are you, like, uh, like in the middle of it. So I want, <laughs> I, want, I want to give you context because nothing is meaningful without a context. And as I talk about the spirit of mammon, it's gonna cover money, resources, but really, mammon is a spirit that's on money, okay? Um, but I'm saying this, and here's the context. We are a generous church, and we have been extremely generous over the years. We are strong as a church financially. We're in the middle of a accounting um, 
like process and they're auditing and they're doing all kinds of things with our balance sheet and our P&L and all that stuff. And we as a church are as strong financially as we've ever been. 2021 was the strongest year we've ever had and 2022 is shaping up to be even stronger than 2021. I think that's awesome, that's amazing. I'm telling you this because context matters. Nothing is meaningful without a context. I've been in church my whole life and you gotta watch in certain churches that the moment the preacher starts talking about money, it's because the church is hurting. And I want you to know that that is not the reason that I'm bringing this message. And you'll see this message will involve money, but it's not about money. It's about something different. And today I'm just gonna show you the indicators of this God, and then next week I'm gonna give you the solution. Um, so the God, the God of mammon, the God of possessions, where is it in scripture? Matthew chapter six is a very obvious place where it is. And here's what Jesus says in verse 19, 19 through 24. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Jesus is talking about your resources and here's what he says. I'm going to show you a kingdom way, a kingdom mindset to look at the resources that your father, your heavenly father has put into your hand so that they are free from the spirit of this world contaminating them, where you will not suffer the pain and you can enter into God's economic system for your life. And he's teaching about this. And he says, um, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This isn't in the notes, but if you, if you would take this down, write this down, please. Resources are a leader, your heart is a follower. It's not the other way around. Jesus says it very clearly. Wherever your treasure goes, that's where your heart goes. You don't even have to try, it's just the way it works. I've seen young men become smitten with an individual and all of a sudden, they're sending resources their way. They're going to dinner, they're going on Starbucks runs, they're going out of their way to get a favorite meal. They're Resources are going in a way and their heart has to follow. It's a principle, it's a law. That's just the way it works. Wherever your resources are going, Jesus is saying, that's what your heart is drawn toward. That's what your spirit is going after. So you have to be mindful of that. He goes on and says this. This is very significant. Watch this in verse 22. The lamp of the body is the eye, pause. What is the function, this is not a trick question, what is the function of your eyes? To see. to see. So he's talking about how you see. In context, he's saying how you see about resources. The lamp of the body is the eye. If your eye therefore is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, if you see well, that's gonna lead you to good places. If you see poorly, he says, if you see, but if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Let's pause. He's saying how you see matters. There are three enemies that I want you to see in your life that function in every area, not just this one. There are three things that seek to rob from you. Fog, fatigue, and flirtation. And when your mindset, when you're, thinking outside of a biblical perspective, you're gonna find that you get real fuzzy, that you, the fog sets in. And when the fog sets in on you emotionally, mentally, and specifically spiritually, you're going to feel an irrational and an illogical pull on your energy. You're gonna be weakened in your energy levels. You're gonna be like, oh, I'm tired. And then you're gonna fight in your mind. I don't know why I'm tired because I haven't done anything. Has anybody ever woken up from a nap and needed a nap? Something's going on, right? 
Like, and I know in this season of our life, we're gonna go on vacation, we're gonna seek to get refresh, refreshed, we're gonna do all those things, and I want that for you. But if you're focused on the wrong thing, you will not outwit the devil, the devil will outwit you, and you'll come back as weak or weaker than when you left. While I'm at it, since we are talking about the spirit on money, I've left for a vacation and needed a vacation from my vacation and felt guilt over overspending while I was gone. I'm the only one that's done it, I know, I'm the only one. I, I'm, I'm, I'm all on my own today. <laughs> it's compounding, watch. The fog sets in when you don't see well according to the biblical perspective. Then you start feeling irrational fatigue and then you start flirting with things that you shouldn't flirt with. I don't necessarily mean people, but it could work that way in a marriage. You could get fuzzy about your, about your marriage and be like, um, oh, and not pay them the attention that you should, and you get tired of them, and then you, before you know it, you're in a one-on-one -on -one text with someone that you're attracted with. That's bad. Call me old school if you want, but I think married people shouldn't be texting with people that they are attracted to unless it's their spouse. Right. It's how you end up flirting with stuff. <laughs> Can I just say this? I don't know why I'm going there, but I, I want it to be out there. Um, affairs don't just happen. People work hard at having an affair. And it's small little things. The fog sets in. Oh, they don't compliment me like they used to. They don't appreciate me. This person, I can tell. They really appreciate me. And what you don't know is they're neglecting their current spouse like you feel like you're being neglected as your current spouse and you're building a foundation on an improper thing and it's gonna cause really a lot of destruction in your life and you have to really guard your lives and your emotions romantically. I appreciate the encouragement. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Maybe you got lost in the eloquence. <laughs> of the fog, the fatigue, and the flirtation. But that's what happens like in your resources. A fog will settle in. You'll get in all these areas, right? And this, is, this concerns me. And, and that's what he's saying. How do you see it? If you can get one point of clarity today where you've been foggy, one area where you've been stuck, just one area. Oftentimes we're looking for all this clarity and all this area. Listen, listen. If we can just, if God can just, through his spirit, just clear up one thing for you today, that's a victory. Just one bit of clarity that the eyes of your understanding, Paul said, that they would be enlightened so that you would know what is the hope of your calling. This whole series is about lifting the fog one element at a time. And so he goes on, Jesus goes on, and it, he's setting us up how you see it, and this is what he says, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. What are you talking about? In case you've lost track on the resources thing, he lays it out plain. You cannot serve God and mammon. Many places translate this money. It's a wrong translation in my opinion. Mammon is a reference to a Babylonian god that was the god of riches. And it's written about this god of mammon that he was an angel that became departed from God's presence. He became a fallen angel but was in God's kingdom. And the thing that separated mammon, the spirit, from God's presence, watch this, it's written of him, not in scripture but someone's observation, that he loved the pavement of heaven more than the presence of heaven. Some Bible scholar tell me, what are the roads paved with in heaven? Gold. So he loved the gold above God's glory. This became a problem and he's, this spirit, I'm going to personify it because I'm gonna get myself into trouble and I'm gonna, lo I'm gonna, lose, I'm gonna lose some followers on Instagram over this, but it's okay. There is a, there is a, Jesus help me. This spirit 
is on our nation and it's wreaking havoc in our country. It is a God of greed, a God of stinginess, a God of possessiveness, and it's destroying us. And it's not new, it's centuries old. It's centuries and centuries old. Um, it, money is not the issue. Jesus isn't saying money is the problem. It's the way we think about it. Many of us, one of the most misquoted, misunderstood verses yeah. is quoted this way. Um, it's it's the, 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 the love of money is the root of all evil, is how it's quoted. The love of money is the root of all evil. That's the text. Most of us think it says money is the root of all evil. Money is neither positive or negative until we attach something to it. Money is neutral, it's a tool. But what I'm addressing is this God of possession that sits on us and then is transferred to our, in our mindset to our resources and that's what makes the money evil. The money is nothing. It's the spirit on it that causes it to go a wrong direction. And money isn't the problem, it's the love of money. It's being consumed with money. Never satisfied with life, worrying about the future, constantly looking for another angle. This rests on our country. Um, God is not against resources and wealth. He's against the spirit that rests on us and on our money and on our nation to contaminate those resources. If the Spirit of God rests on you and on your view of money, you'll be a giver. Now, back to nothing is meaningful without a context. Here's who I'm talking to. I'm talking to a room full and an internet full of people who desire for God's Spirit to rest on their lives and on their resources, right? right? So I'm kind of preaching to the choir a little bit, but so that we don't get outwitted and in case maybe we've laxed our intensity and focus, we need to see what this looks like so that we can war against it and become victorious. Jesus says, you, will, you cannot serve two masters for either, either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Remind me, who said that verse? In church, Jesus. Jesus is always the answer to every question that's asked. Like they know that in the, in the, in the children's area. They're smart, man. Who said this, who, who is being quoted as saying verse 24? Dear Jesus, you can't do it, he says. This isn't my idea. I think Jesus is the one that we go with. He's the highest and best authority on the subject. One will serve the other. Either money will be our focus and God will serve our need to have possessions and resources and we'll use God to get financial gain. That's the spirit of mammon. Or we'll trust God to provide for our financial needs. The right spirit says, I want more of God and he's gonna take care of me. I want every person that's young to get that at an early age. I want you to have such a hunger for God and a trust in God that when you put God first, he always takes care of you. I'm a living example that when you put God first, even when it's tough, God always takes care of his people, always. The mammon spirit says, I need money and I'll use my view of God to get it. It's a self-styled independence from God, which if you read in Genesis chapter 11, it, 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 it outlines it, but for the sake of time, I, I won't look at it. Um, this is where I wanna get myself into trouble, okay? Um, this spirit rests on our nation. I'm not trying to be political, I'm trying to show you how this works. There are some nations that we are bowing down to because we're looking to get it 
for the cheapest price because we're greedy. Should I make it plain? What if we, are you sure you want me to make it plain? What if we said to Saudi Arabia, we are no longer purchasing your oil and selling you military hardware. We are not going to any longer bow down before the God of mammon because you persecute people who follow Jesus and we're just not gonna do business with you anymore. What would happen if we did that? (laughs) Daniel just raised both eyebrows at me, so I know I got a little bit in trouble just then, but I don't care, I'm gonna keep going. What happened if we would not ship everything off to China to be made in sweatshops for pennies and put Americans to work and we just supported one another? Like what? Like... I, 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 today I announced my uh, candidacy for president of the United States. No, 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 no. We continue, why do we continue to trade? Let me just show you this. Am I telling the truth? Why do we continue to trade with these countries that kill, persecute, and incarcerate believers? Why do we do it? Because we're bowing our knee to the spirit of mammon. We say in God we trust, but the truth is, to Babylon we bow. And it's crushing us. Now, this is a, I told you before, I'm saying it again, there is not a political solution to a spiritual problem. I'm speaking to you about a spiritual issue and trying to use plain language to illustrate how it works, right? So what are some indicators of this? Let me show you what this God of possession looks like. Number one, the God of possession, when you experience the God of possession, you are seldom in a place of financial contentment. I want you to see if it's working in your life. You always think about money. Everything comes back to money. Everything comes back to money. Your focus is on either what you do have or what you don't have. Every time an issue arises, the first thought you have is, how much is that gonna cost? Now listen, I know who I'm speaking to. I'm not speaking to people who are irresponsible with their resources. But watch, listen to me very carefully. I need for this church to not use stewardship as permission to be stingy. Oh, I gotta be a good steward. You know, brother, we gotta gotta be on a budget. I'm all for budgets, but I've watched, not necessarily you, but I've watched, and people talking about keeping God on a budget, because we're on a budget and we gotta watch. Let me tell you something. We're good at keeping God on a budget and we're terrible at keeping Target on a budget. Good night, everybody. start, start 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 the van. Why? Why? Because we're not content. That's the issue. And, and we're, we're always thinking about what we don't have. Our devices are, are telling us what we need. It's feeding into our insecurities. I got an ad on one of my social medias yesterday. And I kid you not, it said, do you wanna lose weight? Are you in your 40s? Do you weigh, and I won't tell you what it said, but it was within five pounds of what I weigh. And it said, do you want to, I'm not lying, do you want to weigh this, and it's within five pounds of what I've said out loud that I want to weigh. Number two. (laughs) You find yourself comparing your financial situation to others. This is the indicators of this spirit. Young people, listen to me whether they're siblings, friends, or your age group, or not your age group, you comparing your financial situation to someone else's is a bad rhythm to get into. It's a bad practice. Just stop it. Just stop it now in the name of Jesus. Don't do that anymore because what they have or what they don't have has nothing to do with you. Right, okay, I'll go a little further on that. That when you compare, you're either feeding your inferiorities or your superiorities. That's all the comparison results in. You compare yourself, you're like, I'm better than they are. 
I'm in a better spot than them. Or you say, wow, I'm terrible. They're way further down the road than I am. Comparison, it will destroy your life and it's a byproduct of this spirit getting into your mindset and wanting to rest on your resources. And then you'll try to get your resources to keep up with your ego and that is the recipe for bankruptcy. Okay, I'm preaching to you today, but let's keep on moving. Should I go on? Yes. <laughs> you want me to leave this subject. You look at your lack and become envious and jealous of other people's plenty. When Angie and I were in the market to buy our very first home in the early 2000s, the banking industry was making it possible for people like me in their late 20s, early 30s to buy today what it took my parents 20 or 25 years to achieve. And they were making it available to me today. And my age group, Gen X, we're in our 40s and 50s now. Statistically, during the collapse of 2008, we were the number one people group and age group affected by the real estate collapse. We had more foreclosures in my generation than any of the other generations. Why? Because this spirit rested on us and we, we, we said, I wanna get there fast, I wanna get there in a hurry, and the spirit of this world made it possible and many fell into the trap of that. There isn't any condemnation, it's an observation of how this thing destroyed us. And Angie and I, here's how, I, I won't get into all this this week because next week's the solution, that Angie and I got upstream of that and we did the opposite. They were doing no money down, no income, no asset verification, and you can have a $300,000 mortgage. That's not exaggerating. That's exactly the scenario. You know what my wife and I did? We said, no, nah, we're gonna buy a little $108,000 house and we're gonna put 5% down. That was the best we could do. And um, we're just gonna pay our little mortgage and we're just gonna, we're just gonna make the best progress we can. That pays dividends. Because when you do it God's way and you don't get in a hurry, he has time to get his hand on your life and multiply things so that you can be positioned to move and advance. When you let the spirit of God rest on you, the spirit of wisdom rest on you, you'll go much further than the spirit of mammon that wants to stay attached to all of your possessions. Right, people like, then they criticize the progress you've made, but they don't know all the junk and sacrifice and patience that you endured to get where you are. Right, number three. The spirit of mammon wants your riches to make a statement to others. You're buying whatever makes a statement. Number four. The spirit of mammon has this result. It makes it difficult for you to give joyfully and completely. When this is happening, it's the result of you thinking your finances are yours. Well, what do you mean, Pastor Josh? They are mine. That's the problem. They're not. Not when you and I choose to look at our resources with a biblical perspective. They're not yours. You are the manager of them. God has put this into your hand. It's his that he's given to you that he's asking you to manage well. The Bible says to him that hath, more shall be given and he shall have more abundance. Why? Because he managed what he had or she had well. When you're, Jesus says it this way, when you're faithful in a little, then you qualify to be ruler over much. What's the, what's the much for? It's for others. But I've heard this a million times. I've heard this a million times. Well, when I win the lottery, you better believe the first thing I'm gonna do is write a check to the church. No, they're not. Why do I say that? Because if they're not doing it before that windfall comes, they'll never do it after. That's what Jesus says. Whatever you're doing with a little bit, that's what God is measuring you against for if you qualify for much. Am I making sense to you? And so we, when we have this, we don't lose, we, we, don't, we don't have joy, we lose the joy. You think they're yours, it's a reluctant, possessive spirit. And when you give, listen, 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 listen. I'm not talking about, oh, 
in this context. I know, I know pastors and preachers take it like that. I'm talking about when you're just around town. Because what I don't want, I don't want a people to lead that give when you're here and you're stingy out there. That's a loss. I want you thinking about this when we're talking about others. And when you give, you focus on what you're losing rather than what you're gaining. Um, on the way here this morning, Daniel, will you mind? I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish with this. On my way here this morning, I took, the, I took the longer way from me and I came up East Main Street. And um, I was honestly shocked. I, I know there's poverty. I know there's homelessness. But I don't know what happened in downtown Newark last night but it was like a bomb of misery went off in our city. It broke my heart. Like I almost cried on my way here. I mean, there were just people all over. I saw one man, it's not a judgment, it's just an observation of what I saw. He was struggling. I don't know if it was struggling with alcohol or um, some drug or just fatigue and no no sustenance, no food, no water, but I mean, he was stumbling all over and I happened to catch him right as he was near an unfenced small garden. Like, it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't very large. Uh, eight by 10? And he was, he was kind of rifling through that, looking for food, looking for something on the vine and he found nothing. When we give and we focus on losing rather than gaining, here's what that looks like. We see a person with a sign that says homeless and we form a judgment. And when we form a judgment, we are momentarily or in a prolonged way perhaps giving into a certain type of spirit that's on our resources. What do I mean? If you see a homeless person, the first thing you think is, I wonder what they did to get into that situation. That is not the spirit of God. I know I just kind of dealt you a body blow on that one. I, I can, I know, I know. But I need you to see it. The spirit of mammon, when it gives, it thinks through, I'm giving and it's gone. It, it, it thinks like this, with a person who's in need, it thinks through this lens of, well, I don't want, uh, and, and we, use, we use God to justify our stinginess at times and say, well, they're probably gonna smoke it up or shoot it up or drink it up. And that's the assumption we make. And you know what? They might. They very well could. That's not yours to judge. Right. Oh, I'm gonna talk to you today, church, like it's plain. Amen. What's yours to judge is, did the Spirit of God rest on you to do something with that resource? That's your task. Because see, when it's not yours, and you look at it through the right lens, you let go of it, you let go of it. Oh, I know this is hard to hear. It's okay, but it's hard to let go of because you're like, Oh, no, no, no. See, you've got something attached to your mindset that says, now they have to do what I approve with these resources. No, 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 no. Your assignment is to let it go. And you know what I'll do sometimes? Because that's my assignment. When you have that spirit, you didn't give. It left your hand, but you didn't give. Because when you truly give, it's no longer yours. That's good. If I were to give this watch to my son, I can't tell him where to, where to carry it, where to store it, yeah. when and when, not. I'm not gonna do it, but if I was, <laughs> why? Because I want it, it's mine, okay? It's mine. I've been nice to him enough. <laughs> Can you see? Like I'm holding on to it. 
I'm holding on to it. When we do that with resources, with people in need or whatever we do, you, you know how much or how little this thing has a hold on you when you let it go, if you really let it go. You find your security, identity, power, control, freedom, independence, and significance in what you have. These are all assignments for God and God alone. They're not assignments for your money. We use money and replace our money with God and expect money to give us security, identity, freedom, significance, power, control. And we've confused the power of God with the power of mammon. You're never satisfied. There's always something else, I'll just a little bit more to pursue. And again, I need to tell you, I'm not, I know who I'm talking to. I'm not talking to lazy, irresponsible people. We're hard workers, we go at it, but there is an unhealthy level of never satisfied. Ecclesiastes 5.10 says this, he who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver, nor he who loves abundance with increase. This is also vanity. Ecclesiastes 5.10 in the NIV says this, whoever loves money never has enough, and whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. It's living beyond your means. It's overextending yourself financially and unwilling to make cutbacks because of your ego, and you have to keep up and keep up and keep up. It's something that's spiritual, that's driving you, that God wants to set us free from. Next week, I'm gonna tell you exactly how we can do that. Today is the theological foundation of what this God does in our life, and next week, I'm gonna give you the practical things on how you can break free.